have said that there are more people alive today than have ever lived before in the history of the world. Um, I don't know if that statement is true or not, but one thing I do know is that the economic rise of China has been the greatest economic transformation in the history of the world. That's where I've spent uh, the last 34 years of my life. And um, uh, as Napoleon said, you know, when he was asked in Alba, when he was in exile, an Englishman came to him and said, he was asking about the China question with the opium wars and whatnot going on um, and, and the issues that they had. And he said, China's a sleeping giant. Uh, be careful because when she wakes, she will shake the world. So what we've seen now is that that has happened. And to follow on what our previous speakers have said, um, that there's been the greatest economic transformation in the history of the world. At the same time, though, we as intellectual property practitioners have not really given it enough credit and said, well, there, there's been a circular or a vicious cycle downwards that there is no protection in China, and therefore we won't protect in China. Many international corporations have said that time and time again. And as a practitioner running a law firm, running an intellectual property firm in China, that's the kind of uh, headwind that we get when we're trying to deal with the Chinese. When we're talking about the US-China trade dispute, um, and, and I get a chance to do that because I'm a commentator, and I have been for the last 20 years with China state media on legal affairs, uh, trying to discuss this idea about transformation uh, or uh, uh, the intellectual property being stolen or forced, uh, the transfer of intellectual property is kind of a misnomer. It's a misstatement. And the people in this room should know about that better than anyone else because with intellectual property, the devil is in the details. Many times people don't file their intellectual property in China. Uh, right now, today, as we speak, not in 1987 when I moved there, there were very, very few people that were filing, and that they didn't allow intellectual property or patent protection in areas of health sciences, in areas of agribusiness, because that was to be dedicated to the world. I was able to work very closely with a fellow called Zhang Chung Su, who was actually the, the father of intellectual property, and helped to write the first patent laws, policies, and regulations, worked together with him at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and actually saw the birth of it. So what, what do we have? We had the greatest economic transformation in the history of the world, and that happened as a result of it being the workshop of the world. And I was able to, to see when I was there to be able to notice that there was a group of people that were coming in that weren't interested in intellectual property. When they ascended to the WTO in 2001, they were able to, uh, there were then a second set of folks that were interested in protecting intellectual property, and they quickly forgot about the other folks. Now, China is at a crossroads right now, and like I said, I've been a commentator on China Central Television for the past 20 years. I cover the Lianhui, which is the National People's Congress, every year. And this, every single year that I've been doing it, the, the National People's Congress rolls out what they think the economic growth will be. Last year it was, the, uh, the year before it was, the, the target was 6.5% and they hit 6.6% growth this year. Every year it would be an exact number and the number would either be that number or exceed that number. I guess like Benjamin Disraeli said, I guess there's lies, bigger lies, and then there's statistics. Who, who really knows? But the point of it is that uh, this year, they've come out, the National People's Congress, and said that the economic growth will be somewhere between 6.2% and 6.5%. So there are folks back in, in Beijing that are wiping their brow and trying to come up with the economic uh, uh, pathway in which to move the country forward. How is it going to move forward? It's no longer they've decided that it's going to be the workshop of the world. They need to have strong, effective intellectual property and I think oftentimes the West has a tendency to look at China and say that it's all about intellectual property theft that has happened to them. The lens of the Chinese now is IoT, is AI, is blockchain. And that's where the future is. 
And the other thing that we often see by folks that are in this room, again, that becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy by people that are not living and working in China and don't run outfits and don't have to help people when they're already in trouble, is that, um, that the litigation system honestly has gone from really the, the worst, perhaps, to the first. That they don't have the Markman uh, pretrial hearings, we don't have discovery. When people ask me how much does it cost to bring an intellectual property or patent case in China, it's approximately 10 times less than it is in the least expensive jurisdiction in the United States. That's based on a whole host of things. It has the most uh, educated intellectual property judges uh, in the system. Again, a lot of times we have a hard time getting the perspective. It's like the two fish that are meeting each other and swimming. They say, hey, how's the water today? And he says, what's water? Uh, the other fish says, we've grown up because those of us who live in America, Article uh, 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution actually protects intellectual property rights. The first patent was actually signed by George Washington. China has just come into it since 1985, and they are the ones that will be the catalyst for that. Uh, with regards to licensing, with regards to contracting, a lot of these things I see by practitioners are self-inflicted. They don't have China as the, as the situs of the jurisdiction because they think they can't get a fair trial there. Uh, but it's like uh, Willie uh, Horton said, the, the, the famous bank robbers, when he was asked, why do you rob banks? because that's where the money is. The reason why you have to have enforcement in China is you have to be able to enforce those judgments where the money is against those that are infringing upon that. So in the license agreements, we see that. So like I said, there's huge improvement. Uh, the, the future is with the, the changes in China's uh, economy. They've done some remarkable things. For example, t today is uh, November of 2019. China has said that they're going to eliminate or eradicate uh, poverty for 30 million people by 2020. That's a month from now. So, I mean, they did start a couple of years ago, but there are tremendous strides that are being made. With regards to those of us who are dealing with China going forward, the largest place where patents are being filed, for example, and trademarks are being filed in the world, you have to look, go forward with an optimism and, and be able to participate in the market and look in through their lens to be able to succeed. So with that, I would like to uh, also thank the organizer of this for letting me say a few words. It's been a fantastic morning with some very dynamic speakers, and I would also like to see if I could take a selfie, if I could, <laughs> while we're here. Why not? I, I hear the young people are into that now.